My guest is Derek Jensen, author of many books, including Bright Green Lies, A Language Older Than Words, and Endgame, The Problem of Civilization. Derek, how are you today? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Doing great. Thank you. So recently you have been rereading William Shirer's Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. Tell me what motivated you to do that and what you're getting out of it. Well, first, uh, that book always has sort of a special place for me because it was associated with one of the smartest decisions I ever made. And that was in eighth grade. I made this decision that there were a bunch of books that I would not be able to read because they were so big or maybe in some cases so difficult. So what I would do is every night I was going to read 10 pages of a book and Shira is not a, just not a difficult book to read, but it's big. It's like 1,480 pages or something. So I figured there was no way I was going to read that, you know, at lunchtime during school or anything. So I did that. And one reason that that was, I'm so pleased with that is because is that I was able to get through, have been able to get through, well, that's 3,600 pages. If you 10 pages a night, that's 3,600 pages a year of, I was able to get through a lot of philosophy I never would have read. I got on this kick in my 20s where I realized I knew nothing about art history. So I read biographies of, you know, all, you know, probably 10 or 15 different, different major. So it was really fun um, just to, and it's, it's free basically, you know, it's, it's just, you know, I can do 10 minutes like right before I go to bed or while I'm eating dinner or something. So it, it, this was sort of separate from my pleasure reading. So anyway, and, and rise and fall of the third Reich was the first book I ever did that way. And so it, it holds a special place for me that way. And second, I, I reread it. Um, just to see if it held up. Uh, um, and it did. It's still a good book. And there are a couple of things that I really take away from it. One of them is that, you know, we hear all the time, it's just Nazi is a common epithet that's thrown out basically for anybody we disagree with. And this reinforced that that's an unfair tactic because the Nazis really were really were bad. They, they did some extraordinarily terrible things. So just because somebody's going to vote for Trump or just because somebody is going to vote for Harris, that does not make them a Nazi. So when, when, you know, they, they, they put in place systematic programs of extermination of the Jews, of um, the Roma of the of the Russian prisoners of war. It was they 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 were and they waged aggressive wars. So sometimes online, if somebody says, "Oh wow, somebody's a Nazi because they believe this," it's like really. So they've waged campaigns of aggressive war that have killed millions of people. Yeah, it's really what you're saying. Um, and so first off, there's there's that sort of hyperbole that I try to now get away from but like one of the examples that I'd forgotten was that the Nazis had plans in place that if they overtook Britain, they were going to move every male between the ages of 15 and 45 to the continent and use them as slave laborers. And they of course drafted slave laborers all over the place. It's, so anyway, it's, it, it, I think people really need to think hard and long before they, call somebody who disagrees with them over immigration or something, a Nazi. Mm -hmm. And so that's the first thing. And the second thing is that, that if I had to name sort of one most important theme that runs through the book, it's that Shirer continually expressed surprise, whatever word is far beyond surprise, that the German people continued to not go against the regime and continued to ignore the atrocities, what I'm trying to say, 
continue to ignore the atrocities that were being continued that were being perpetrated in their name and he's he's again and again just how could anybody do that and even when i was in eighth grade and then reading it again just the past few months it has it has struck me his level of surprise because we are doing the same thing in terms of the destruction of the planet and we're all just going along with our lives and you know the oceans are being just vacuumed and the world's being bathed in endocrine disruptors and the atrocities um it's just that one of my favorite lines I've quoted ever is not by Shira. I don't remember who it's by right now. Um, unquestioned assumptions are the real authorities of any culture. And this, you know, really in many ways, Shira's book, I mean, that's another thing that Shira's book did when I, when I read in eighth grade is just opened up a huge exploration for me of how can people participate in atrocities and how can people uh stand by while atrocities are are done and in many ways that my book the culture of make-believe was was a result of sort of ruminating on that question for 20 some years where and one of the things that i i, I didn't get this from shira but i got this from robert j lifton and and from other books i've read that there is sort of an instrumental thinking that can lead to a lot of problems and sort of an engineering mindset. And a great example of that was, and this again is not from Shira, it's from, from Lifton, that so the at first what they were doing on the Eastern Front is the Einsatz group and the mobile killing units were shooting Jews face to face or shooting them in the back of the head. And one of the problems that the Germans faced was how do we is that there was tremendous alcoholism among those units and terrible morale because it's really hard to be to murder tens or hundreds of thousands of people that's a hard psychically and it's obviously hard on the people that are, that are being murdered don't worry about me having my loyalty in the wrong place here but the, the point is that the germans from their perspective faced a problem what do we do about this terrible morale what do we do about the terrible alcoholism so what they did is they converted mobile delousing units in the mobile killing vans it's a technical problem we got alcoholism let's solve it instead of stopping the rich the, the real problem which is that you're murdering thousands and thousands of people so they created mobile killing units um but then they had which which basically they hooked up the exhaust tank or the exhaust uh pipe back inside so they put a bunch of people in shut the doors run the car run the truck for a while and they die of carbon of, they did have carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide poisoning and but then they had another problem which is what do you do and this is the language they used in their engineering questions they, they would send out requests to engineers how do we solve the problem of the liquids and solids on the bottom and what they really mean by liquids and solids is the feces and urine that the people defecated and urinated when they were dying and so it was an engineering problem. How do we solve this? And so they put in drains in the bottom. Well, it's still a problem because the, the, the liquids and solids wouldn't collect. So now they had to slant the bottom. So the point is that every step they just do, how do we solve this technical problem? And we run into the same thing today. And this just ties to unquestioned assumptions being the real authorities of any culture in that um, how do we... Uh, how do we increase grain yield on croplands? That's presuming we want to. How do we make the economy grow? Mm -hmm. Presuming we want to. Mm -hmm. how, right. do we, how do we irrigate the desert? That's presuming we want to. How do we, um, you know, how do we get more, more trees? How do, we, how do we more effectively, you know, this is a, a big jump, but in the 1980s, I was in my early 20s, and there was the big the big environmental fight in the Pacific Northwest was jobs versus owls. And 
but it was it was a complete sham because the cut was going up and the number of jobs was going down because of raw lag exports and automation. But my point, the reason I bring this up right now is that that's a problem. It's like, okay, how do we reduce our labor costs as in the in the timber industry or in any industry? Well, automation's the way to go. So you create these big machines that basically just, you know, one one operator can now operate a tree that stacks all the logs and that that you've decreased. And the same is true in every field. That this is a huge question is is oh I was talking to um uh, Yvonne Schoenard a few years ago, uh, the the guy who founded and runs Patagonia. And he was telling me about there's a, a big industrial hose factory in Italy that has three operators, one person to basically oversee the raw materials coming in, one person to oversee the computers running all the different hose manufacturing machines and one person to oversee deliveries out. And that's it. That's the whole machine. And this is this is a rational decision from the owner's perspective. But my point on all this is that that's one of the things that has that Shira started me asking, how do people how do people go along with atrocities? And the answer, one of the answers, there's many answers, but one of the answers is this instrumental thinking. Let's, we got a problem, let's solve it without asking, does this problem need solving? Without asking, what are the moral implications of solving this problem? What are the downstream implications of solving this problem? Um, the, this anyway, reminds so that, me of, you know, you've taught me a, you know, you've taught me about Lewis Mumford and you've thought about his work and the, the, you, you invent a technology and then the you know, like society invents technology and then the and then the technology starts to shape society. So you have all this momentum and you solve problems related to the further implementation of that technology. And it kind of takes on a life of its own and you're solving for the wrong variable in the terminology that you, you use a lot. Yeah, that's, that's, that's absolutely true. And we, we, and within the system, it, it makes sense. You know, it's, it's really, you know, and this is true within, within the, the Nazi system too, within the, the pre-World War II and World War II system that, there were any number, quite a large number of people who became Nazi party members, not because they agreed with the Nazis, but because you couldn't get a job as an engineer, say, unless you're a member of the party. Mm -hmm. And so, right. okay, I got a choice. I can either, um, you know, work at a, at a job that pays less, or I can join the party and get a job that pays more. Or I can make all sorts of leaflets denouncing the party and I can spread those around and then I can get killed. And mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's a pretty easy choice, frankly, um, within, within the context of that. And it takes, uh, it takes special sort of people to not go along with that. And then, of course, on that level, we can apply. And again, I'm not saying that we are Nazis. But, but I'm saying that that same, I mean, the same thing is happening with cancellation. There are so many people who disagree with a lot of the sort of woke stuff, but they don't say anything because if you do, your reputation is destroyed and you lose your career. I've lost my publishing. I've lost multiple publishers because, you know, I don't believe that men can become women. And um, and just remember what happened with Katanji, Katanji Brown Jackson at um, her Supreme Court hearing when they asked her, so what is a woman? She said, I'm not a biologist. I can't answer. And she would have lost her party support had she answered that. I mean, she's a mother, for crying out loud. So my point is not that issue. My point is mm -hmm. that we all, I mean, that's, that's part of the thing is that humans are extremely social creatures. And 
peer pressure and shunning have always been incredibly powerful motivators and um and frankly more sophisticated motivators than it's like uh mumford said that only half-baked authoritarian systems rely on just a cudgel to keep people in line what you really want to do is mix in some social rewards and every abuser knows this too there's a great line in the battered women's movement uh one good beating lasts a year that you know for the most part even in a personal domestic violence situation there are a lot of for a smart abuser there are a lot of carrots mixed in with the sticks um because if all you have is sticks mm -hmm. then the, the calculus of getting out is 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 dramatically changed so the point is that that we all this is just in many ways this is just behavior modification 101. so postmodernism asked what's real and great question and then it answered it in the the, the worst way possible which is the answer postmodernism came up with is there is no reality there are only the stories we tell and that's profoundly and it's just that's just ridiculous and none i mean even the most thoroughgoing postmodernists can't believe that because if you put some postmodern academic on the edge of a cliff and you said so reality doesn't really exist there's only the stories we tell each other if that's the case why don't you take one step forward and let's see what happens they wouldn't do it because they know that reality exists and so the the problem is that postmodernism has completely taken over academia and completely taken over a lot of society and it's not really a surprise that it has because it's really, this goes way back because this goes way back in, in our philosophy and is part of one of the central problems of the culture is that, that there's this thing called the great chain of being. And that's, this is ancient Greece. And it's, it really is central to our entire culture of at the top of it's a scale of perfection. From at the top, you had God, who is completely disembodied, nothing but disembodied thought and, and perfect. And then you had the angels below that. And then you had humans, man and then woman. And then below that, you have who are sort of a battleground between mind and body. And then you have animals who are more in body, less mind. And then you have plants who are even more body, less mind. And then you have soil, et cetera, all the way down. And this is this is one of the reasons we're killing the planet is this belief that what comes out of our mind is more important than what comes out of our body and we see this everywhere that people get so excited when or scientists get so excited when they get one step closer to creating life in the lab they create some enzymes and they're one step closer it's like yeah nature's creating life all the time and postmodernism is just this, and then, and then this one way that this sort of imbues all of our thinking is think about like, what are some of the greatest inventions of all time? And some of the greatest inventions are the lever, the wheel, uh, the pulley, um, gunpowder, I don't know. And those are all things we created with our minds. What about metabolism what about photosynthesis what about proprioception what about sex those were all created by nature but they don't count as inventions do they because they were created with the body not with the mind or what are the greatest pieces of art in the world sistine chapel mona lisa uh beethoven's ninth um yeah why not a sunrise why not the color of leaves in the fall why not because those don't count those weren't creations of those weren't those are created by bodies so this is so postmodernism is really just the latest and most insane and most extreme version of this notion that what comes from our head is what is important and what comes from our body is not and 
that ties back to the whole trans thing as well, the transgender ideology, because what our bodies are is not important and what our minds think is what is important. And if a man thinks he's a woman, then he's a woman as opposed to what physical reality says. And so I don't understand. And the same thing happens to, I don't understand why anybody has ever been surprised about my position on this because my position has always been physical reality is primary. And we can put interpretations on it and our interpretations may be wrong, but physical reality is always primary. I'm always most interested in what is actually happening in the forest. Not what I think is happening in the forest. Let's build up. We can build up all these thought structures. And that's one of the things that we do is build up thought structures. But they have to be started with physical reality. I mean, Earth First was called Earth First for a reason. And that's one of the wonderful things about Earth First. Of course, they're a complete shadow of their form, the toxic mimic of their former self now. Um, sorry, you were going to say Let's something. Let's talk, talk about, about uh, nature and physical reality. No, not at all. Let, let's let's talk about uh, nature and physical reality. I wanted to ask you about the Klamath River is going to be undammed, I, I read. And uh, I've learned a lot about from you, a lot from you about salmon. And the idea is that if you undam the Klamath River, then salmon will be able to uh, travel up it and do what nature uh, intended them to do. So tell me what's going on there. And uh, it, it seems like good news to me, isn't it? Yeah, it's definitely good news. Uh, I think it's seven dams along the Klamath are being removed. And that is, that's very good news. It's always good news when a dam is removed. Um, whether, and yes, that will help salmon, whether it is enough to help salmon is a bit of an open question because the, the dam removal is one part of the, or the dams were one part of the problem. Another part of the problem is uh, water removal uh, in the upper reaches for agriculture. So whether the Klamath retains enough water to maintain the cold enough temperatures for the salmon who are cold water fish remains to be seen. So I, I needed to put that in. But having said that, again, the removal of dams is, is always a good thing. Dams, uh, dams destroy rivers. And we, we, we really miss collectively misunderstand rivers that rivers we tend to think of them as just water flowing through a channel and that channel remaining somewhat uh in place uh because that is more convenient for us but the truth is that rivers are supposed to ride like snakes they're supposed to dance across the landscape i don't know if you've ever seen pictures of um, there's, there's wonderful drawings or maps of the, uh, Mississippi river and how it would change year by year. It was absolutely beautiful. Right. And there's, I was once talking to a, uh, fisheries biologist in, um, up in the Olympic peninsula who loves this one river. And she said, every time the river floods, it breaks her heart because it kills a lot of trees, it kills a lot of frogs, it kills a lot of deer, it kills a lot of fish, you know, fish who are left behind, uh, various other creatures killed in the, the, the power of the flood. But also every time it floods, it makes her really happy because this is how new habitat is created. And she said, so every time a river floods, it's a question of, short-term habitat loss versus long-term habitat gain. And I love that. And also that's a, a great metaphor for other issues in our lives. You know, why do we stay in jobs we don't like? Fear of short-term habitat loss versus long-term habitat gain. Why did people not, why did people in Germany not oppose the Nazis? Fear of short-term habitat loss versus long-term habitat gain. Why do we stay in bad relationships? You know,
fear of short-term habitat loss versus long-term habitat gain. But the, but the but, but back to the Klamath. Um, oh, so so dams uh, confine help to confine rivers to they, they help control flooding, which is an essential part of of a river's life cycle or life habits. Um, so the dams being removed is 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 a is a great step, and is something that I wish and hope would happen, you know, everywhere. It will happen everywhere eventually, but uh, because the, because dams are not, uh, rivers get dammed all the time by mudslides, by lava flows, and then they eventually break through. And every dam that is made will eventually, that's been made by humans will eventually go down. And the question is what's left of the river when it does. So we'll see what happens. I wonder, uh, somehow that the, the story about the salmon reminded me of uh, prairie dogs. And when I thought about prairie dogs, I re remember, here's the thing. We have the Endangered Species Act, which I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's probably a good thing. But to focus on endangered species, it's, it's, if prairie dogs, for example, they're probably not endangered, but they have been removed from 95 to 99% of their original range. Therefore, they're not performing the function that they used to perform. Uh, so I would much rather see us uh, focus on restoring habitat acre by acre, uh, square mile by square mile, mm -hmm. instead of waiting until a species is on the brink of extinction before we, it seems to me like it, by that time, it has already been removed from a, gr a great part of its original range. So most of the damage has been done. So I, I think the Endangered Species Act is a very important thing. And it, uh, that said, I, I completely agree with what you're saying. And um, this, I think people have absolutely no clue what life was like prior to this culture. And I've mentioned often that in California, if you were anywhere near a body of water, you would probably see a grizzly bear every 15 minutes. And, you know, I've written about how there were flocks of passenger pigeons so large, they darkened the sky for days at a time. And there were prairie dog villages. I don't know the numbers. I'm making this up. Like there was one prairie dog village that had 4 billion prairie dogs. Don't quote me. There's just some inconceivable amount it was like i don't know five thousand square miles or something it was, it was just huge and i recently learned just like within the last week learned something okay so again i want to emphasize that there were runs of salmon so thick that you couldn't see the bottom of the stream and you couldn't see the bottom and you would I've, I've heard people, I've talked to people who even as recently as the 1950s, there were runs of salmon that they could hear for miles before they would see them. They would hear them for miles before they see them. And I've read accounts of people who couldn't fall asleep because the salmon were so noisy with the splashing of their tails against the water. And we have no clue what that's like. And I just learned another one the other day that, so about... 50 yards this way is a creek called Elk Creek. And it runs uh, up into the hills and also runs from here about five miles to the ocean. And I was talking to a friend of mine who's a beaver expert, just making conversation. And I said, and, and there are no beaver on, on this. They, they were long since trapped out. And I said, so... 500 years ago, how many beaver would have been between my house and the ocean? And I was expecting him to say, oh, 50, thousands. There would have been thousands just in that five miles. And I said, how many would have been in 
the Smith River is about 20 miles north of here, and it runs, I don't know, let's say it runs, I don't know, 50 miles east up in the mountains, and then it has all sorts of tributaries. And I said, how many would have been on the Smith, Smith River? And I was expecting him to say a couple thousand. He was like tens of thousands. He said, we have no clue what it was like with streams. Like he said, the word stream is not actually accurate for most of North America because the water doesn't stream. Instead, what it's supposed to do are these broad wetlands where, uh, you know, beaver dams are everywhere and the water is just sort of very slowly flowing down. And there's a, a beaver, uh, some beaver habitat uh, or some beaver dams up near this town, Cave Junction, that uh, uh, the beaver dam is, 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 is here. And then just above it on a hill is a huge marijuana grow, illegal marijuana grow. And it's huge. And the uh, fertilizer runoff is just absolutely terrible. The, it turns the water just yellow where it runs into the, the beaver pond. But by the time it goes past the beaver dam, the water's clear. And that's, mm. that's one of the things that beaver dams do. Anyway, so I agree with you. And, and the thing is, those, those creatures, all you have to do is make some habitat or allow some habitat, and then they actually make the habitat better. The beavers make the habitat better. The prairie dogs, like you were mentioning, make the habitat better. Um, the salmon make the habitat better. The passenger pigeons used to make the habitat better. And really, for the most part, all we have to do is leave them alone. And... Mm -hmm. Also, one more thing, I think you raise a hugely important point that people don't talk about nearly often enough, which is that the time to try to protect a creature is not when there's 15 of them left, but when there's many, many left. And I think about this, you know, last year was a big year for cicadas, in, not in this part of the country. I've never lived where there are cicadas. Anyway, a big, a big year for cicadas. And cicadas' reproductive strategy is to have so many emerge who have no defenses that they overwhelm the predators. So that's the good news is, and they've been doing this for forever, very successful. The bad news is that creatures like that are really susceptible to collapse because they don't have stingers. They don't have the ability to fly. Their ability is to, once again, have so many of them, they can't all be eaten. The same thing happened with passenger pigeons that, that they got down, that they're basically passenger pigeons would overwhelm predators by having, you know, 300 or 100 million birds in one flock. So, you know, from the perspective of the flock, who cares if 100,000 of them get eaten? And they got down to like one big flock and they were killed by humans, of course. But then uh, my understanding is the last big flock disappeared. I mean, nobody knows. And that's, I might be talking about Eskimo Curlews who are the same, sort of the same situation. But anyway, the point is that if they get below a certain number, a critical mass, then they're gone. And, and that's another thing that kills me about all this is that one of the reasons that I'm an environmentalist is because I'm not stupid. And I'm also kind of fundamentally conservative in that I think it's a really terrible idea to wipe out a run of salmon that you might need to eat tomorrow. I think it's a terrible idea to wipe out prairie dogs when you don't know what effect that has on everybody else around them. And prairie dogs are pretty much the same, that they, one of the words for them is nature's candy bar because so many creatures eat them. And so mm -hmm. when you wipe out prairie dogs, who else are you harming? And then there's, we, we wrote about this in Bright Green Lies. I don't remember the number, but gopher tortoises in the Southeast, they, their, their dens are used by, I'm making up the number, like a hundred different species. And when those go, when the, when the gopher tortoises go, then, then what happens to all of those others? It's, right. it's just, 
one of the things that I think is that just makes me happiest in the world is to learn about uh, the intricacies of nature. And, you know, I, I've lived in the West my whole life and I've interviewed a fair number of people about the effects of fire on these fire dependent forests. And it's really cool that there's a species of, of woodpecker who has evolved called the black back woodpecker. And the reason it has black backs is because it flies in right after a forest fires over and the black is camouflaged against the scorched trunks. And there are species of, of pine whose, uh, whose uh, pine cones can't pop open and release the seeds until there's been a fire. And they evolve together. And I just recently, just this last summer, learned about some species of beetle who have both smoke and heat detectors on their heads. And whenever there's a fire, they fly toward it. And then as soon as the fire's yeah. over, they go in and start eating the wood. And that sort of... Uh, You know, the, the, there's this great line, I don't remember who said it, which is, nature's not only more complex than we think, it's more complex than we're capable of thinking. And when you say that about prairie dogs, that's what it makes me think of, is that nature is incredibly complex, and it's just remarkably stupid to take prairie dogs out of the picture. And it's remarkably stupid to think we can take them out of the picture and predict what will happen. Let me uh, talk about beavers for a minute. Um, I have friends and colleagues who purport to know what it would take to rehydrate California. The idea is whenever I see a desert, I assume that it wasn't always a desert. There are places that are, you know, low precipitation, but if a place is a desert, maybe it used to be a desert, maybe it didn't. But, you know, one of the strategies for rehydrating California is to allow beavers to flourish. Like, you know, between where you are and the sea, there would have been thousands, tens of thousands of, of beavers. How, how great would that be for the water cycles, just from the standpoint of, of, uh, of water and from the standpoint of, you know, a wet landscape is usually better than a dry landscape, especially if it can be done naturally. And um, so, you know, and all, the, the beavers were eliminated because of pelts. I, I've heard that for one thing, there used to be about 350 million beavers in North America and they were eliminated primarily because uh, for pelts, the fur trade, taking the pelts to Europe primarily. And I also heard from one source that there used to be like 8% surface water, 8% fresh water by surface area in North America. And now it's down to one, largely because of removal of beavers, but also because of draining whatever swamps were left, that kind of thing. But wouldn't it be great if uh, California could be rehydrated primarily just by letting beavers thrive? Um, yes, I'm, I'm a big believer in most, well, somebody you might think about interviewing is Jacob Shockey. He's great. And one of the things he talks about is how he lost one job. Basically he was, he, he was working doing wetlands restoration and there was a lot of money involved with, uh, bringing in logs to put woody debris uh, using bulldozers to to like sculpt the land. And the reason he lost that job is because it hit him that, and he does, tells a much better version of the story, it hit him that uh, they could save all this money by letting beavers do all that work and just bring in beavers. Doesn't cost anything. And then the beavers uh, make the wetlands. And it costs, I don't remember how much he said. 
I remember he said million dollars, but I don't remember per, per how much, how many acres of, of land you would get con reconverted to wetlands uh, by doing it with heavy equipment as opposed to um, letting beavers in. It's so, so I think that's a, a great idea. I mean, I do, I mean, you, you said this, but I also want to emphasize or underline that some places actually are deserts and should be deserts like the Mojave mm -hmm. or uh, much of the Great Basin. But even much of the Great Basin, uh, you know, there were there were beavers along the Humboldt in Nevada and they should be returned. And and mm -hmm. the Central Valley of California, which is now just the, the, the agricultural land was incredibly rich or i've got this book called a country so full of game that's about iowa that iowa is one of the what was once one of the most biodiverse places in north america um and yeah it, beavers i would i would be absolutely delighted if beavers were a reintroduced or b simply allowed to be um in California, Oregon, all over North America. I mean, beavers in many ways created this continent and other people can do a better job of describing that than I, but I, I absolutely agree. And also that's the thing is rehabilitating land. We just, for the most part, yeah, we can occasionally have to step in and do something. A great example of that would be Aleutian geese. Um, they were wiped out of most of their islands in or off most of the Aleutian islands by introduced foxes and uh in order to allow the Aleutian geese to exist to continue to exist they had to wipe out the foxes on those islands um, but again they were introduced foxes they weren't there ever before so sometimes you do have to step in but for the most part once you've stepped in all you have to do is just step back and let nature do its thing because life really wants to live. And as long as we haven't pushed it too far, you know, you can push it too far and then you've killed it forever, passenger pigeons. But I mean, I really think that if we just, if we let beavers do their thing, they'll, they'll bring back and, and we let prairie dogs do their thing. Uh, but both beavers and prairie dogs and lots of other beings are still just being slaughtered wholesale when they could be doing, and they're trying to do the work of rehabilitation. I wanted to ask you about salmon, but since we're talking about beavers, I guess salmon are able to jump a beaver dam, that kind of thing. Or swim in between either way. Um, yeah, it ends up there, okay. there are a lot of, a fair number of studies have been done that show an extremely positive correlation between beavers and salmon. Um, that uh, beavers, it depends. Okay, beavers don't harm any salmon species, but some salmon species are improved more than others by, by beavers. And an example of this, the reason I know this is because the Smith River, there was a study done of coho of between about co the relationship between coho salmon and beavers, and there's a very positive correlation. The beavers help coho salmon a lot, and the article that I read uh, was saying there was a lesser relationship between chinook salmon and beavers because chinook salmon are more main stem salmon. They tend to stay, mm -hmm. at least on the Smith, they tend to stay in the main stem of the river. And there'll be some beavers on the main stem, but uh, that's not really where their prime habitat, their prime habitat is more along the tributaries. Well, or that I shouldn't say that. What I should say is that beavers don't put a dam across a bigger river. What they'll do is they'll live in the bank. They don't have the same mm -hmm. effects. So there'll right. be beaver dams on the tributaries. Like there were beavers on the Mississippi, but of course they didn't make a dam across the Mississippi. They just live in the bank. And the right. point is that coho are tributary salmon, small stream salmon, so they end up having a very strong correlation with beavers. Um, mm -hmm. 
and yeah, I don't, I don't actually know. You could ask Jacob this. I don't know if they jump the, they jump the beaver dams or if they swim between the the sticks. I don't know how they, I don't know how they do it. Right. I'm pretty sure on the way down they would just swim between because they're still pretty small, and they can tell us about the. Well. Tell us about the effects of salmon on the ecology in and around the stream or the ecology of the forest, that kind of thing. So I'm going to say something two ways. First, I'm going to say it the way I learned it, and then I'm going to say the way I prefer. And that's salmon bearing streams or salmon forests near salmon bearing streams grow three times faster when salmon are present. Three times, not 33%, three times. So if they were going to grow one foot a year, they grow three feet a year. And I don't like saying it that way because that puts the salmon being gone as the standard, as the, as the baseline. What we should really say is salmon dependent forests only grow one third as fast when the salmon are taken away. And that's, they have a huge knockoff effect of just millions of pounds of food come up and are eaten by everyone. I don't know. I don't remember the numbers. I've read them somewhere, like 50 different species, 100 different species. I don't know. Uh, everybody from eagles to bears to, uh, to, to flies to um, to the baby salmon that I don't remember the percentage, but a significant portion of the baby salmon food is the previous year's salmon still in, you know, still in the stream. And I sometimes wonder what a human ecological, what, what is, what is the proper role for humans ecologically? And people will say, Oh, we name the animals and all that. Or we manage them. And, I, I, I don't agree with any of that, but one of the fundamental rules I can, I can say that I'm, I'm clear on is really not that much different than bears. So I think one of our roles is to carry nutrients. So the salmon comes up the river. So I think that yeah. one of bears roles in forests is to redistribute the nutrients that they eat a salmon at the stream and they walk up and they poop it somewhere else. And I think that the same is true for vultures. They eat a dead body here and then they release it. And I think that that's one of humans. I think that's one of our purposes is to just redistribute nutrients. So you go down to the stream, you catch salmon, you carry it back to camp, you eat it. And then you're walking around the forest and you poop. And that's not very, that doesn't really fit with the great chain of being because it doesn't uh, make it. So we're thinking all these important thoughts, but I think it's one of our roles. Um, so, because because the nutrients have to be distributed somehow. You know, the salmon come up the stream. The nutrients can't all stay right there. And nature. Right. This is this is the thing that's cool about nature is it comes up with all these extraordinary ways to get all these different things done. You know, how do you move a bunch of nutrients from the ocean up to the forest? Well. With salmon, how do you move the nutrients from the stream to the rest of the forest? Well, that's bears. How do you move the nutrients? I don't know. How do you move the nutrients back back down into the stream? Well, that's a falling tree, or that's a that's a the water flowing down and carrying those nutrients from the from the side of the hill into the stream. Um, so let's do one more question. Okay, well, I want to run this by you. I've been a climate reporter for six years, and uh, I'm decidedly at, at a place now where I think that uh, the, the single biggest influence on climate is, um, is biology. And uh, job number one in fixing the climate, for one thing, climate shouldn't be like a be all and an end all. It shouldn't be something that we try to fix in the absence of 
uh, helping other living beings thrive because that should be our first and foremost. But I'm just, anyway, if we've lost, yeah. I just want to say what? that's that problem solution mindset again. The problem is carbon. The solution is, mm -hmm. I, I'm not saying that you're saying that. I'm saying I agree with you that, that that's that same, same mindset is just, the the problem is carbon. What are we going to do about that? And then we ignore everything else and we destroy habitat. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. No, that's all. I just wanted to get your take. Well, one thing is, uh, according to Canadian scientist Vaclav Smeal, we have lost, or you know, by human causes, we've lost about 50% of the biomass on Earth in the last 5,000 years. And if that's anywhere in the ballpark, for one thing, it wouldn't be surprising, but let's assume that's true. Then job number one would seem to be replacing that biomass because it has such a for one thing, those other living things have an, a right to exist in, in, irrespective of their usefulness to us. But more to the point, it has a, a regulating effect. It, you know, it, it, it has a, an effect on climate and weather. That's all. So I wanted to get your, your response to that. That's my last question. So can you say the last sentence again? Because Tony was yelling. Tony the dog. I, I got everything but your last sentence. Well, the if, if biomass itself, biomass ecosystems, the flow of water through ecosystems has a tremendous regulatory. It regulates temperatures and it it causes rain. It causes the cycling of water and nutrients. And um, to me, that you know, if I could change anything in the climate conversation i would i want people to understand how important how consequential it is that we've lost all this biomass and what we need to do is somehow step aside and allow that biomass to repopulate uh i'm not no. shaking my head at you i'm shaking my head at okay. us collectively that i mean yeah. i completely agree with you and that it just it just it just if we would just step out of the way. So the image I keep thinking about with environmentalism is you have all these doctors, and this is the Endangered Species Act thing that you were talking about earlier. We have all these doctors and nurses who are doing everything they can. They're giving infusions to this person on the table and they're bandaging right. up wounds and they're doing everything they can, except they're not stopping the guy who's standing there continuing to stab them. Hmm. And it's the same with, a lot of this, the 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 carbon stuff too, that it, it blows me away when they go, oh, we're going to spend X bazillion dollars to build this carbon <laughs> capture machine. It's like, right? They're called trees, and they're called grasses. <laughs> right. And yeah. And oh, you know how difficult it is to uh, to restore. A peat bog? Oh, man, it's so hard. Here's what you have to do. Step one is you plug the ditches that are draining the peat bog. Step two is if it's really been damaged, then you reintroduce some of the mosses that have been taken out. Or if there's already mosses there, you don't have to reintroduce them. Step three That's it. Just plug the ditches. That's all you have to do. Or you know right. how you you know how you uh, rehabilitate wetlands, which are gr great, great, great uh, uh, carbon sink. How's that? So, and the way you the way you rehabilitate uh, wetlands, which are great carbon sinks in the United States or in North America at least, step one, in Europe too, step one, uh, reintroduce beavers. Step two, leave them alone. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna see a pattern here. The way, you, uh, the way you let forests come back is 
Step one, you don't cut them down. Step two is 20 years later, you don't cut them down. Step three, 20 years after right. that, you don't cut them, cut them down. And step four, you don't cut them down ever. That's it. And the forests know how to do it. You know, they, they, we get this, this really makes me mad. The forest service uses like insect infestations as excuses to cut forests, which is really stupid. That's like yeah. saying, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm sorry, Hart, you have the flu, so I'm going to have to kill you. That literally is the Nazi tactic. Right. The Nazis did that in the death camps. Somebody gets typhus, they don't want it to spread, they kill them. So in that case, that analogy works. But in any case, what insect infestations, no matter where they are, what those often are, are attempts to reintroduce diversity. Because you've got a monocrop. If you've got too many dug firs in, in one forest, the forest doesn't want that. So it, it kills off a bunch of those dug firs and creates a... And also, this is another thing that kills me. And I know this is off topic, but this is just so important. No. That dead trees, dead standing trees are more important to the forest than live trees are. And... Absolutely. Their habitat for more creatures. And so just leave it alone. Right. There's no here, such thing as waste wood, you know. Here, yes. I, the industry yes. has this term waste wood or wood waste, and there's no such thing. Well, yes, I completely agree with you. And even larger, John Livingston was the one who helped me understand this. There is no surplus in nature. Um, mm. There are no surplus salmon. Doesn't mean you can't eat any, but there are... Every salmon you eat is a salmon that somebody else doesn't get to eat. And every piece of wood, just like you said, every piece of wood you take out of the forest, every tree, not wood, every tree you take out of the forest, living or dead, is a tree that somebody else doesn't get to live in. And we, the dogs are going to start screaming in a minute because there's a siren. Yeah, really, for the most part, we just need to leave stuff alone. And nature knows what to do. Yeah, that's I agree. the bottom line. Is and that's that's what ties everything together here. Is that great chain of being? Do we know better than nature? Or does nature know better than us? And nature knows how to live. Mm -hmm. I'll say one last thing that I just love. There's a friend of mine. He's a, a fisheries biologist, and we were sitting by the ocean eating lunch one day, and he said, "You know, sharks have the most." Uh, the perfect roughness of skin for the least drag as they swim at speed through the ocean. And I know that this guy goes to hmm. church. So I asked him, do you believe in some sort of intelligent design then? And, you know, that's, that's pretty smart. And his answer was, there is great intelligence in time. Hmm. And I mean, for me, that's everything. Right. Well, that's a great place to end, Derek. Thank you so much for joining me. Okay. Well, let's do it again sometime. All right. Thank you. Okay. Have a good one.